Hello and welcome to the Manage Self Need Others podcast, mainly for experienced and aspiring people managers. I'm your host, Nina Sunday, and this is the show to help you explore ways to become the best version of yourself at work as a manager. Each episode, you hear from some of the brightest business minds on the planet who share your passion to elevate and transform team culture. They share insights in self-leadership and leading others. Together, we can make workplace culture better. Are you ready? Because it's time to manage self, lead others. Janet M. Harvey, best-selling author of award-winning book, Invite Change, Lessons from 2020, The Year of No Return, is CEO of Invite Change, a coaching organization that shapes a world where people love their life's work. An early adopter for creating a coach-centered workplace, Janet has trained and coached leaders at Fortune 500 companies across six continents for more than 25 years. A board director for the ICF, International Coaching Federation Thought Leadership Institute, Janet also serves on the ICF Global Enterprise Board and is an ICF Global Past President, a certified mentor coach and accredited coaching supervisor. Welcome, Janet Harvey. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be with you and your audience in Australia. And I love the way we're connecting the continents through this uh, medium called podcasting. Just a delight. What's interesting is it's a global uh, podcast now. It's got global reach because we were recently in the top 100 charts in Egypt. Outstanding. And we've been in the top 100 charts of Ireland and India. So the world is finding us. That's very nice. (laughs) I I often will say to leaders, we live in a zero geography world now. We do. We do. So So. I like your title, The Year of No Return. You want to tell us more about why? Well, I think we all know inside ourselves why it's the year of no return. But what's your take on that? For a very long time, I have thought that organizations and the leaders within them have over-revered results and throughput and transactions and productivity and effectiveness, all of which is very important. But in the over-reverence, a little bit like a teeter-totter out of balance, they've left out uh, relationships and well-being and meaning. And what happens when we have trauma in our being is that we start to question our values become a a bit more to the surface, not deep down underneath rooted and taken for granted. And we ask questions of ourselves. Is this really what I want? Am I feeling rewarded, fulfilled, satisfied? And as with the great resignation you and I were talking about, this is of course one of the drivers. And I find that people are wanting to go back to a normal that actually isn't anything we found satisfying and we know it now. So when I say the year of no return, not only can we not go back to the to the previous way, we really don't want to. So stop pining for it <laughs> and but, pay attention to the front windshield. But aren't some leaders thinking that uh, we will go back and we'll just mandate people to come back to the office? Is that a, is that a big error? I think it's a big error. And I think what it does is it reveals the insensitivity to the experience of the employee. Uh, I'm sure you've been reading lots about customer experience and employee experience and employee value proposition. And for a long time, it's been kind of this esoteric idea left to the statisticians in the business information systems of the company. And it's no longer that sort of thing on the shelf. It's every moment, every day the hybrid and remote work environment reveals the managers who are not highly skilled at creating meaningful conversation, nor of embodying accountability. One of my little bugaboos, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this. We hear this phrase all the time, hold the person accountable. It's not possible. (laughs) Accountability, (laughs) accountability is personal. I can accept responsibility because you've given me authority to do something. And that's my definition of accountability, accept responsibility for authority granted. 
I can't hold you accountable short of compliance. Well, what is compliance? It basically says, I'm better than you. I have more power. It, you have to do what I say. That command and control structure died 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago. And again, the pandemic has revealed the crack in the in the container. We're not going back to that environment. And you know, the new workforce at, at you know, millennials are 56 million of the workforce here in the US, with another 53 million coming behind them with Gen Z. No tolerance for command and control. So leaders who can't create the space and allow for meaningful conversation are going to fail. Mandating isn't a formula for partnering in any way, shape, or form. Is this a bit of clash of the generations then because we've got a new cohort coming through and the senior leaders think that the world hasn't changed, that they can lead the same way they always have, but then they're getting older and the cohort is younger, so the, the gap is wider now. Yeah, I think that's certainly one of the factors. I was looking at some Gallup data, and for the last decade, we've seen a a fairly steady, small, incremental improvement in engagement. And the 2020 data that was released in July of this year shows 36% actively engaged in organizations in the U.S. and 20% globally. Why we aren't incredibly ashamed of those numbers is beyond me. (laughs) Because 36 means you have 64 that are not actively engaged. That's underperforming to potential as an organization, let alone what does it say about the employee experience that managers are creating for their teams? I don't want to go back to that. That's not a a year I want to return to ever. And it's flatlined so far in 2021, which is very disconcerting. And I think reinforces what we're hearing about the Great Resignation. So, in fact, are people pretending that they're engaged to the manager, but behind the scenes, you know, they say their own little thing to their to their colleagues, and managers are under an illusion that they can just, you know, command. But in fact, people are uh, aren't really well. That's what disengagement is. They hear, but it doesn't reach their heart and soul. They're not uh, right. they're not fully behind. Uh, the, what the ma- the manager's um, instructions or or, 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 or goals or, or results for the organization. Yes, that's exactly right. And, and there's two categories here in the not actively engaged. The ones who are going through the motions, right. which means the organization is not getting their discretionary energy. They that's have right. it, but they're not using it at work. And the number of actively disengaged, which means they're toxic in the workforce. They're, they are in a bad mood. They are judgmental. They dis, they're disruptive and they're actively looking for another job. So, you know, some data, motivation data would call that inertia, but I call that actually riot and chaos because that's the voice that gets heard. So they, they're paying attention to that 16% that's actively disengaged, trying to get them to settle. And they're ignoring this huge underutilized resource. And that's the manager's job. So maybe what's happened is in this over-reverence of productivity, we have underdeveloped the folks who are responsible for creating our culture and sustaining a spirit of synergy and collaboration. And almost every customer I've talked to has said, we are doing huge investment in relationship skills, partnering skills, collaboration skills, communication skills for next year. We realize the error of our ways. Right. And there's still some senior leaders who aren't, who aren't hearing that message. But I think that they're going to see it suffer in not being able to have a workforce they want. Well, of course, if they're not if a manager is not trained in how to lead, they might uh, display some bully behaviours. And if if they if they are doing that openly in the organisation, and they're not being checked from their their supervisors, well, then that's what's that saying? Uh, what is that giving permission to? So I I just happened to be looking at some incivility data just yesterday. Seven and ten. Americans believe that we are in a crisis level of incivility. The global numbers are higher, eight and a half out of 10. And that could be everything from a bullying behavior to outright violence in the workplace. 
And if you think about everything that's been happening around uh, racial injustice, misogyny, uh, things that we've never labeled because we considered it impolite to do so are now actually getting uncovered, revealed, right? They're, they're no longer the thing you do behind closed door with an HR manager. We're talking about it openly with each other. So I think we have this period of, oh my God, it's really a big deal. What do we do about it? And at some point it's going to settle. Um, my sense is that we all need to learn to say, hey, ouch, that hurts. Mm. So some of it is each of us accepting responsibility for n- naming it when it happens to us in the moment and asking for it to change. And that includes a boss who lets people get away with it. And we, we keep the bully sales guy because he does double the numbers of anybody else on the sales team. But what they don't realize is you are losing out on the capacity of the rest of the sales team. You could eclipse the double of the bully if you had a healthier workplace. And that's a lot of what I'm talking about when we talk about sovereign leaders. I know that was a question you wanted to ask. So. Yeah, that, oh, yes, yes. So that is so true about um, uh, making sure that you, you're diminishing toxic behaviour because it it reduces the uh, the output of, of the others in the team. So, um, yeah, I hear that. Look, we're in a world of incredible change. And in your book, you talk about how managers label change as the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 we have to really change our vocabulary around change. So what's your thoughts around that, Janet? I've actually had people that have said to me, why did you name your company change? And I'll say, <laughs> I didn't. I named the company invite change. And they'll look at me stunned like they've never seen the word invite in front of the word change. And this is how profoundly impactful the word change is in our vocabulary and it's true in all vocabulary not just in English and I think that uh, it really goes to our neurobiology as human beings the oldest part of our brain is the reticular activating system and it's a threat identifier the problem is we've become so busy we don't take any time to calibrate our reticular activating system consciously when we do we can have a very different relationship to change. In other words, it's looking out for uh, evidence of things that are safe and comfortable and familiar and the things that aren't. And it puts it in those buckets. It filters all of the information we take in. And if we're on autopilot, we're going to stay in a rut. We're going to stay in the things that we've decided are comfortable and familiar until something disrupts us. And we say, I don't like this anymore. (laughs) Usually that's trauma. Uh, the sort of illness or a loss in the family, or you lose your job, or you get relocated to a new city you don't like, and you start to question. The great resignation as a result of the pandemic is an example of the reticular activating system saying, you know what, maybe leaving this job isn't all that scary after all. (laughs) And in that moment, if we're present enough, we can say, I know what I want. I want this instead. And the minute we say, I want, now the Raz says to us, I always say Raz because this yep. long, the long with the Raz. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the Raz helps us say, I have what it takes to get what I want. Huh? Now, what do I want to pay attention to first? And we're on our way. That's inviting change, accepting responsibility that we create the experience that we have in our lives do it deliberately. Suffering is a choice. And the alternative, therefore, is also a choice we can make. And when we invite it, that puts us in charge of the relationship we have to our lives. You think about the kind of the seat of the seat of the brain. And, right. and first to develop, it's been around the longest. And of course, the development of the prefrontal lobes is how we began to realize that judgment isn't the enemy. Judgment is discernment. Oh, I can assess rather than react. And therefore, I can respond in a way that's most respectful to who I am and what I want. And that's higher level vibration, higher level thinking. And that's frontal lobe capacity. That's frontal lobe. Yeah. Yeah. So because you talk about the blame game of the rear view mirror. And so where is blame coming from? (laughs) So one of the very best ways to grow in our lives is to have disruption and difficulty. 
Uh, those the, what I call the um, sandpaper moments when everything we know how to do is no longer working, <laughs> right? Uh, a client who says, I've always done it this way. I've put teams together and we've moved down the road and I know exactly how to lay out the plan. And I usually will start with a question like, well, who on your team also has that capability that might have a thing or two to say about it? Well, I don't know. That just doesn't matter. Hmm. And you said the dilemma you're having is that the team's not getting engaged, that you're not seeing them participate and um, initiate new thinking. And now the light bulb's starting to come on. Is it possible that you have not left any space for them to contribute and initiate? Oh, I said, so you see this habit that's worked for you for a long time won't work here. So what are you available for? to have be different. What's more important, participation of the team or you being in control? And this is review mirror, people, process, and participants. It doesn't matter. They're all in our history. Does it match with the current environment? What's asked of us in this moment? What's different in this moment than our history? If we don't take time to take stock about that, we're going to have a breakdown. We won't have the results that we want. So and the antidote, of course, then is ultimately to get very comfortable with what's new here. Come with the beginner's mind or I let a lot of people talk about the growth mindset, which is fabulous work from Carol Dweck. That's right. And ultimately, it is about can I get present, not be in the rearview mirror of my reliance on my history and my expertise? Can I be in wonder and allow myself to see something fresh in front of me and then invite others to be in that wonder, too? Oh, I love that sense of wonder. In fact, a very interesting thread in your book is the is the value of curiosity. And do you think some people have lost their, the power of their curiosity? I think it's a really useful question. Uh, have they lost it? I think what's happened is it's buried underneath layers and layers and layers of personality and nurtured um, beliefs and principles and behaviors that someone told them was effective. And as I said, more often than not, people don't wake up. That's what I call it, awaken uh, to how much they've been living on somebody else's terms, not theirs. And, so and that's not just at work. It can be their family. Everywhere. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Mm-hmm. And of course, you as a coach, you use uh, the power of questions to kind of get people to understand where they're perhaps not living their full authentic self. You talk about getting down to your essence and your core. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? (laughs) It's a really fun process, actually. And and I think in some ways saved my own life. I um, I was one of those you know high achievers, uh, a type personality when I worked in corporate, and just took it right into my entrepreneurial life, and ultimately ended up getting physically sick to the point where I couldn't travel and I couldn't work. So in that time, I started to realize how much I had adopted. Uh, a whole bunch from my parents who were both working parents uh, by the time I came along as the fourth child. I had adopted the efforting and uh, high energy focus of bosses that I'd admired, despite the fact that they actually weren't very nice bosses. (laughs) They weren't nice to me or anybody else, but they were really good at getting results. And I thought that's how I was going to win the day. And I began to realize that people didn't like working for me. I was too intense. Oh, it was too hard. I I held a bar way too high, and I realized that that wasn't me. Like, oh my god, that broke my heart. The first time one of my um, bosses told me people won't work for you, I just sobbed. Like, how could that be? That's not my heart, right? And that began the journey of, in my mind, getting to essence is unlayering all of the ways in which I had adopted from others to be successful, what wasn't actually my essence and how tender my essence really was. Oh, that's so, so beautiful. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. And I, it, it, I, I can look back in my own youth now where I, I had some role models that really I was putting on their uh, costume, their mm-hmm. modus operandi, and then I got feedback and it's like, 
well, that wasn't really me anyway. I thought that's the way I had to be. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Interesting. Because exactly. uh, um, a profound question you sort of ask in your book is uh, what parts of my life story contradict belief in my essence and blocks the vitality and actions that maximise my potential? So that's such a profound question. Yeah. And it's one I'm I'm with all the time now. Once a quarter, I I spend time journaling on the question, what's blocking my full potency today? And I and it's that simple of a question on purpose because I'm changing all the time, my environment is changing all the time, my relationships are changing all the time. And I can get my RAS can decide to protect me and to put up walls that I don't intend to put up. And if I'm not actually staying alert to all of that change going on and asking the question, what do I want now? I'm going to fall back into habits that are more protective strategies at an earlier time in my life when maybe it was important. And I, as I said, I had working parents. I spent a lot of time by myself and I don't look like everybody else. You know, I have a birthmark on my face, which pretty early on made me different and it makes a lot of people uncomfortable to this day. Oh. And I've had to learn to say, hang on a second, see beyond the skin, right? We can't ever know a person from the outside in. And it's up to me to create the environment for people to feel comfortable to do that, to get past their own boundaries and barriers of feeling uncomfortable with something that's different. So, you know, my my sense of it is that if we are if we're more patient, if we can learn a little bit of silence, if we can slow down and and keep examining, who am I? What do I want? What matters to me? What do I stand for? What do I believe in? And then most important, be willing to be disturbed by what somebody else says and lean into learning. What might I learn from you who has a different point of view from me that would broaden the camera lens with which I see the world? How might I incorporate more of somebody else? I don't have to stand in my position. I know that life changes all the time. Heck, I grew up in the middle of the United States and my parents were Republicans. I could no more be a Republican today than leap over the moon. (laughs) So I've changed, right? And I might still have some principles that I care about that might be categorized one way or the other. But I have a responsibility to notice what is it that matters right now, not yesterday, but now, and to trust that other people have the same potential to be in a learning conversation and grow into something bigger. Well, I mean, if if managers are working with their teams, do managers have to uh, these days act more like a coach and and take take time out to have mentoring sessions with their with their people? And if so, how, how frequently should that happen? Yes. And uh, the hybrid remote work environment is making this even a higher priority because people don't feel a sense of connection. So more frequency, more time spent in the personal, uh, showing care and uh, actually being involved in each person's well-being these are very important capacities. This is that that side of the teeter-totter that's been under-revered um, needs to come into some balance. And if you're going to get productivity, it's at the investment in relationship building with the workforce. And I think that managers want it too. So as they begin to do it with their team, they're going to ask their bosses to do the same. And You know, the Quakers will tell you that in all of the hundreds of years of research they've done, it only takes 10% of a population to change the environment. So if you have a team of 100 leaders, and if 10 of them start behaving in a more humanistic way, you're going to start to change the climate. With time, those conversations begin to evolve culture. That takes a little bit longer, but we can change the climate very, very, very quickly. So managers need to think about the connection between results and the employee experience. If they're not getting the results they want, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about recruiting or sales or marketing campaigns or operations or manufacturing throughput, whatever you measure for your results, if you're not getting what you want, the place to look first is how am I being with my team? So look at self-manager and then look at What are you doing in your calendar? 
how much time do you spend with your one-on-ones? Most people will tell me once a month, like not going to be enough. Hybrid and remote workforce is going to need weekly conversations. They don't need to be 60 minutes. They need to be 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Check in. How are you? And not let your team mow, mow you over by giving you the laundry list of status. Say, stop. How are you? Really? Mm. Yeah. In fact, uh, whenever I, I bring it up with managers, they'll say, oh, yes, once a month, that's all I can fit in. But I look back when I, when I had my largest team of about uh, eight people, my biggest failing was not not enough one-on-ones, no one-on-ones 20 years ago. But I, I think I think it's been a growing awareness now in leadership capability, the importance of the one-on-one conversation. And it shouldn't be a performance review. I mean, you know, uh, right. the whole idea is to have this ongoing conversation. So the performance review is just really perhaps just another conversation with um, more structured questions, but it's not a scary thing and not something that a manager will save up uh, mistakes and uh, uh, to, to bring it up, to bring it up. So, exactly. you know, Oh, I got called have, to the boss's office, right? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you got, you got to have fast feedback and also two way, two way conversation. So I, I always said success was when they initiated the conversation with me. Um, while I'd had standing time for people, when I noticed that people freely came to me with new ideas, freely came to me to challenge some decision we'd made, freely came to me with, hey, I went to this event and uh, this is what they were talking about. And it seems to me that has some influence on this other thing that we're working on. That told me they were as invested as I was in the success of our team. And that's what I'm going for. If I'm not having that experience with the team, Again, I got to look at me. How am I signaling that I'm not available for that? And ultimately, my life got so much easier when I stopped trying to do their jobs for them. Gosh, I spent a lot of time and energy hiring them. I know they're capable. Why am I, why am I holding this so tightly? When I let go, when I let go a little bit of the status quo and I made room for them to initiate, our results went off the charts. Paradoxical, I agree. And it is how it works. It it it, it takes uh, 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 the ability to move your ego aside because some managers see that see their role as being the source of the of the uh, as the problem solver as the source of the solution, and mm-hmm. they tell their people you know w- instead of going to them with questions and being open to. The, the the power of the group. I mean, we're, we, we've come up with more elegant su- solutions if we're involving everybody. Is that right? Yes. And, and I know some managers don't believe that. No, it takes too much time to open it up to the group and be inclusive. Only what they don't pay attention to is the whole long journey to the result. So they've got their eye on the prize. We need to make a certain result happen. Uh, they don't recognize that the things you do along the way are either going to speed it up or slow it down. What slows it down? Rework, because we didn't take enough time to listen to everybody. Change in the environment that doesn't get communicated to the team that's actually producing the result. Another stakeholder in the organization who is duplicating work or working at cross purposes, and there's no communication because the leader is left the team to its own devices and you get to implementation and everybody's going, hold it. You can't do this. It's going to have all of this ripple effect. And we've just added another three or four months to the timeline. So this has consequences, not allowing for a thorough inclusive process at the very beginning. And they're not always factored in because we're in this immediacy of the moment and don't see the system and actually the whole journey to the end results. And And that's skill building for managers. Yes, get the ego out of the way, but it's also thinking more systemically. Janet, I think you've really nailed it there because uh, in in organisations, we seem to have this um, acceptance of everything takes twice as long as you expect it to do. Instead of going, what are we doing that's making it take twice as long? Exactly. (laughs) Wow. That's that's a light bulb moment. (laughs) That's great. Now, just before we close off, 
and I'm going to ask you how people can can work with you. But there's one question that I I thought about, which is you you talked about people often judge us, others as being either more than or less than themselves or or whatever they're comparing it to, and it leads to inequity. I mean this this whole thing about judging people and the assumptions we make about people. Can you talk to that? Yeah. So most of my life, I've heard two key phrases that are part of being a good human being, be non-judgmental, or at least if you can't do that, suspend judgment. And um, I always thought those were pretty good principles to follow. And then I uh, began the the coach training journey, and I'm now I've been a coach educator since 2006 with leaders all over the world. Yeah. And I realized that judgment is innate to the human condition. It is how we make meaning of things, and meaning matters to us. And unfortunately, if we try to push judgment down as the bad guy, all we're going to do is like a pop bottle. It's going to get really fizzy in there. And then when we when we let it go, we're going to express ourselves out of proportion to the situation. So it's always going to be healthier to have our judgment, to, to allow the free flow of our discernment, better word than judgment. Mm. And ultimately, what we want to do is to short circuit the autopilot back to our RAS, right? To notice when we have judgment. That's what I would suggest to everybody. And pause, take a breath huh, what's causing the judgment to surface in the first place? What am I reacting to? What is it that I'm attached to that this person isn't attached to? And why am I attached to it? And what do they know that I don't know? And that's the key. The minute I say, what do they know that I don't know? Now I'm ready to ask a question and be a learner and be available for something else to emerge because their idea and my idea by themselves are not enough. We're going to get caught in a ping pong game going back and forth. I can short circuit all of that if I've noticed judgment and paused and asked a question for learning together. That's the formula for us all to be much more responsive and much more respectful and inclusive as we go forward together. More than less than thinking is protective strategy. I'm going to hold myself more than and you less than to feel better about myself. It doesn't last very long. (laughs) <laughs> right, right. And and you do describe in your book the practice of reflective noticing. So that's exactly what you're talking about. It's that's a that's a, a an emotional intelligent uh, intelligence skill. So we need more high EQ managers, don't we? <laughs> yeah. And it's it's high EQ managers and more invested in the quality of the relationships they have in their lives than they are in the quality of the results, trusting that the quality of the results will come out of the relationship and partnering and collaboration that they inspire and embody and activate and in some ways maybe even demand, right? To to embrace a sense of dignity to all that is around them. Those are the leaders who are going to soar in this next decade or two to come. And, and of course, uh, one of the things you mentioned in that uh, example before, you know, about things taking twice as long because we're not communicating, collaborating, it's that whole silo effect where you have different teams in their remote silos. If they're not communicating with the other teams, that is where time's going to be lost because of you have to make up for that lack of communication. So it's best to bring that all on board right from the right from the get-go. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you and I were talking about uh, digital transformation too, and there are some really marvelous tools that have come on the market to assist remote teams to be able to pass the baton and really work on a project 24 by 7. It's not a replacement, though, for the conversation. And I don't think it has to be in person. We've all learned to be in this virtual environment here. And the more transparent we can be about who we are, right, allow our vulnerability to be able to say, I don't know, what do you know? boy, would that be healthy? We can um, we can use those tools more wisely. The tool will not solve the problem alone. We still need to be in relationship. I say tomato, you say tomato. We got to figure it out. Wait a minute. We're talking about potatoes. Oh, no wonder we're not on the same page. Oh, that's a good example. That's fabulous. Now, if people want to work with you, do they work? Can uh, Obviously, you get people working with you from all over the world, you know, in any time zone. 
um because you can you can always match up the times but do they work with you personally or do you have a team of people that uh, that are coaches how, how does it how does it operate janet <laughs> yes yes and yes <laughs> so Invite Change operates on six continents, uh, and we do work with leaders and teams in enterprises, both individual and one to, what I call one-to-many. We do learning programs. If you want to build coaching capability or you want to lead by authentic self-presence or maybe what you're wanting is to navigate a change process and how might our coaching capability skills provide some readiness in the workforce. Those are some examples. Then of course we do traditional executive development. But my real passion right now is working with lots of people on the front line to have them have generative conversations every single day. And we've brought forward something called the learning cloud where self-managed learning can occur and then be supplemented if you want with coaching, group coaching or team coaching or um training their managers to actually do the intervention themselves uh, to support their workforce to be more generative and um, create healthy climates. That's what I, we're, our, our motto is shaping a world where people love their life's work and everything we do in the learning and coaching space contributes to that. Well, that sounds absolutely marvelous. And it's, uh, it's invitechange.com. That's correct. And we'll have the links in the show notes. So that's great. And your book is on Amazon or? Yes, it is. Yeah, yes, it I, is. I, I, it, I've, I've read it. It's it's very high vibration thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, it'll really trigger your thoughts to really think about the whole big picture of your life. I really encourage people to read your book, Janet. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. It's been a marvellous conversation. I really appreciate your time and uh, thank you so much. You do great work in the world and uh, wonderful to talk with you today. Thank you. Well, it takes one to know one. So (laughs) you keep going as well. Uh, We can't get enough people to uh, take some time to invest in themselves and love your work. Thank you so much for having me as your guest. My pleasure, Janet. Thanks a lot. Yeah. This episode, we've been speaking with Janet M. Harvey on the Manage Self, Lead Others podcast for experienced and aspiring people managers. I'm your host, Nina Sunday. If you like this podcast, go and tell a friend. Everyone I meet who listens to this show say they found it because someone told them it's a good show to listen to. And come back every week. We interview people who share insights on how to elevate and transform team culture. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. Thank you for listening. Until next time, ciao for now.